Thanks for joining another edition of Trail Runner Nation. My name is Scott War. And I'm Don Freeman. And today we have a repeat guest. You may recognize this name from way back in 2014 when we had Lanny Basham on for the first time. So the name may sound familiar to you, but you also may know him from his Olympic success in, two th- in, <laughs> in 1972 at the Munich Games. He secured a silver medal at the 50 millimeter rifle three position event and again in in seven, 19, and again in 1976 in Montreal he returned to get a gold medal. He has many multiple medals from world championships and national championships, but he started to contribute to the mental side of the game. He developed a mental management system. He's published a book called with winning in mind. And we talked about that quite a bit on the last podcast. Scott and I listened to it again this morning and realized we have so many questions to continue asking even about that book. So with that, with that said, Lanny Basham, welcome back to Trail Runner Nation. Well, thank you very much. Great to be here. Thank you. Hey, Lanny, I I have the, I have a, 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 a question to maybe kick this thing off. Um, why did you name the book and the the business that you run now mental management instead of mental toughness? I know that there's a lot of people out there that are saying you need to suck it up, you just need to be tougher, you need to you need to just push through, you need to be m- mentally strong. Why is it mental management versus mental toughness? Well, I considered that uh Back in my day, back in 1806, when I was, <laughs> uh, we uh, back in the 70s, um, we we used the term mental toughness to refer to the mental game, and our opinion was that the Army Marksmanship Unit, uh, we we thought that mental toughness was something you had; it wasn't something you could learn. And because it wasn't something you could learn, we weren't trying to learn it. Mm. Uh, had, well, uh, while I was there, the four and a half years that I was there, uh, we never had one class on how to how to be mentally tough or how to how to build the mental game or anything like that. And actually, when uh, uh, so when I I my story is basically one of. Uh, I started shooting the way most people uh, compete. Uh, I was focusing totally on form without any concern at all of what I thought about or anything like that. I, I thought that performance was a function of skill. That's it. And if you're more skilled than the next guy, you beat the next guy, and that's the way it is. And uh, I would find out later that that's not true that uh, performance is a function of three mental processes, uh, conscious, subconscious, self-image. And conscious is what you think about. Th- change what you think about, and, and your body re- responds to that. And, and so you got to control what you're thinking about. There are helpful and harmful thoughts. When you think about harmful ones, it hurts you. you think about helpful ones, it helps you. And so I wasn't concerned about that. I was thinking about whatever popped into my little head. I wasn't trying to manage anything. I was just trying to react to it, I guess. Mm. And and uh, uh, and I'll tell you what that did. It, 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 the third third one is self image. So you've got conscious, subconscious, self image. Self image is your habits and attitudes. It's and the best way for me to describe self image is that if 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 you and I have equal skill. And we're and our, and our mental process is exactly the same. We're one hundred percent. We have the same equipment, same everything. The only difference is we're in a shoot off together for a title, and you think you can beat me, and I think you can beat me. It's over for me. <laughs> That's self image. That's self image. So self image is 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 what is what you think you can do. It's how you relate to the world and all that stuff. Well, all three of those are, are necessary for performance. And I was just focusing on one and not paying any attention to the other two. And that focus and a lot of hard work managed to get me to the top four 
in my country at a time when the United States dominated international rifle shooting. And uh, my teammates all had world titles, and uh, some of them Olympic gold medals, and all of them had, were world champions. I was world champion. And I was on the team for three long years without winning anything, working on form, 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 not paying any attention to the middle game because it wasn't something you could learn. And I bought into that. And finally, I got to the Olympics in 1972 and I made the Olympic team. I didn't win the tryout. My teammate won the tryout and uh, and he was the best shooter in the world at that time. He had, he held the world record. He was reigning world champion. He had a silver medal in the previous Olympics, and he was he was favored to win. Nobody knew who I was, and we were competing in in uh, Munich, which is kind of the epicenter for my sport in the world. There are more shooters in that part of the world, and Olympic rifle shooters than than are in, in any place else, uh, and so. Uh, this is, he was, I was training with him and, and um, we go into the competition. And I thought there's a lot of pressure on this guy. He's, he's got to win the gold medal. I mean, nobody's going to accept anything less than a gold medal uh, for him. And when he had a silver medal last time. And so maybe he'll choke under the pressure and I'll be able to catch this gold medal. And, uh, and I figured it this way. You know, if I can win a gold medal, it checks a box that no one will care that I haven't won anything the last three years. If you've got a Olympic gold medal, it pretty much seals the deal. And so I, I said, I'm just going to do everything I can to win this thing and try as hard as I can. And, uh, and that strategy ended up with me choking in, under the Olympic pressure. And uh, my my teammate Jack Ryder didn't choke. He won the gold won the gold medal, and I choked. And uh, when I lost so many points that I didn't think I could possibly medal, pressure was off, and then I shot fine. And uh, I was the most surprised person in the world when I got a silver medal out of that. And uh, and Jack and I came home with it, knowing that there was something missing. And so. For the next two years, I interviewed Olympic gold medals from other sports and world champions to find out what they were doing with the middle game. And uh, there were no courses around. I mean, sports psychology just started. Uh, there, there, there. They really they didn't have any programs or anything. And uh, when uh, when I started interviewing these the world champions, back in those days, we didn't have cell phones. We had answering machines. <laughs> so what you did is you left an answering machine. You left a message on their answering machine. And my, 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 the message that I la left a hundred times was, uh, I, my name is Lanny Basham. I'm an Olympic silver medalist. Uh, you don't know me, but I need your help. Call me back. Wow. That was and powerful. They, all, they always did. They always did. And they were wonderful. Uh, nobody had the whole program, but everybody had a piece of it. They didn't call call everything. that they didn't have a common vocabulary of how to talk or anything like that. But I started seeing some patterns develop among the people that I was talking to. And after a while, I got even better at asking the right questions and, and, uh, so I saw there, there's a system to this, and I worked through it until I, I decided to name it, and I decided on mental management. I wasn't going to use mental toughness, because then they, they, they would say, oh, yeah, that's the mental toughness that they teach at the Army Marksmanship Unit. <laughs> we didn't teach anything. <laughs> so, so mental toughness didn't work. and so But mental management kind of sounded like what I felt when I was running this system. And um, my first opportunity to see if the system would work, whether it was the World Shooting Championships in 1974. Now, we held the World Championships in my sport every four years and the Olympics every four years, and they alternate two years apart. 
So we had the Olympics in 72, then 1974 World Championships. And I entered four uh, events, individual events, in 1974 uh, World Championships. And I got an individual medal in all all four of those, excuse me, six of those, six of it. And, um, but I won three of them. Wow. Uh, so I came uh, out of the world championships, uh, three-time world champion. Hmm. And then two years later, I go to the Olympics. And by that time, I had refined this a little bit more. I won the gold medal in the Olympics the next time out. And... Um, I had the same kind of pressure on me in Montreal that uh, that Ryder had in, uh, in in Munich. I I had a silver medal in the previous Olympics. I won all the pre pre Olympic competitions, uh, and uh, I was favored to win. Uh, we weren't in Munich; we were in Montreal, which but uh, still, um, that uh, I was it was expected that I would I would win the. And uh, so I had that kind of pressure, but mental management worked and I won the gold medal. And then two years later, world championship shows up again. I win that. And uh, then in 1980, it was, it was a little more difficult for me to win the world championships in 1980 because uh, uh, president Carter boycotted the Olympics right. in 80. And uh, so, um, and that's a sad thing, you know, because, uh, I've got some really good friends that the only Olympics that they ever made was uh, 1980, and they didn't get to go, and that's 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 too bad. Um, so by the by by the next World Championships, I developed a vision disease that uh, medically retired me from competing, and uh, my vision changes uh, all the time, and I I can't can't get a prescription to hold uh, well enough for me to, uh, to to tell the difference between a 10 and a 9 through the sights of an international rifle. So when I was uh, number one in the world, uh, all of a sudden one day and the next day, I'm done. And wow. there's nothing that they can do, it, do about it. But, uh, but I get to do this mental management, which is really pretty cool. So that's... Well, and, that, and that's why you're on here. You know, you're thinking, why why are we talking to a, a world champion marksman about running? And what you said earlier, I think it ha makes a complete um, crossover to running. You know, when, when someone decides they want to become a runner, a trail runner, an ultra runner, whatever, they get the gear, right? They get the shoes, they get the right hydration pack. They learn about pacing. They learn about the technique they learn about um, um, nutrition and hydration. And uh, we spend probably 90% of our time working on the technique. And we all know that there's a mental side of this that is that you, that you have to have. And that's why we've invited Lanny on here to talk about this because it's so important and it will change the way that you train. It will change the way that you compete. Um, so thank you, Lenny. I, I have a question. You mentioned the three spheres, conscious, unconscious, and self-image. How, what was your self-image as a child or a, a young man? And, and how did that influence you or how did that change over time? Uh, well, my self-image as an athlete and as a young person was that Nobody wanted me on their team. Mm. Say how good an athlete I was. Um, I was. I played alternate right field in Little League Baseball. <laughs> <laughs> the position number 10. <laughs> this, is, uh, this is where you just wish he would go home, <laughs> not, 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 not embarrass you by having... Uh, yeah, I was slow, short, and uncoordinated, and um, that, that didn't work in basketball either. It didn't work in anything I tried. And finally, um, I'm in sixth grade. I developed quite a reputation as being non-athletic, and uh, we were studying Olympics in school, and the teacher made the statement in class, you know, it's possible somebody in this class could be Olympic champion someday. I wonder who, who would have the best chance. 
And this little boy sitting next to me jumps right up and says, Teacher, I don't know who'd have the best chance, but I know for sure who'd have the worst chance, Lanny. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> and uh, right in front of the, all of the class and everything like that. And uh, I decided that, that that was it. I was not going to let that pass. And so I went home and told my parents how uh, disappointed I was in that, that this happened. And, and my father um was uh got a battlefield commission in world war ii and uh kind of a tough guy and uh my he said well just keep trying you, you you'll find something and my mother on the other hand hauled me off to the library and made me check out books on olympic athletes i think she just wanted me to read <laughs> <laughs> but i started reading books about olympic athletes and and that's when the dream started uh, I, uh, I just had to find a sport that a slow, short, uncoordinated guy could do. And it wasn't long after that, uh, somebody invited me to a rifle club meeting and we didn't have any guns in the house. And, um, we fished a little bit, but we didn't hunt. And, um, I, I asked him, I said, well, tell me about rifle shooting. And he said, what's well, Olympic sport? I said, are you sure? <laughs> one of the books I was reading, you know, there were rifle shooters, you know, at the in the Olympics, and he says, "Oh yeah," he says it's an Olympic sport, and uh, I said, "Well, how tall do you have to be to be a rifle shooter?" He said, "Well, it doesn't matter how tall you are." I said, "Well, how strong do you have to be?" He said, "The rifles aren't that heavy." I said, well, <laughs> "How fast do you have to be?" He said, "You don't understand. You don't have to be strong, tall, or fast." To be the best shooter in the world, all you got to do is stand still. <laughs> this is the only sport in the Olympics where you're trying to make a body stop. Well, I, had, <laughs> I had trouble making it go, but I had a lot of time training for this out at right field when nobody was doing it. That was why I became a rifle shooter, was because it was it was it was the opposite <laughs> of athletics, and uh, so you're trying to make the body stop, and uh, so so uh, so is it so as a young kid, your self image was probably not that great, or I, I am impressed that, that as soon as he said something negative to make you maybe have a a negative self image, you had the 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 immediate reaction that i'm not going to believe him that's not who i am no i i uh, i was encouraged by the books that i was reading you know when i when you read wilma rudolph's story mm -hmm. here she has polio as a child and she was told she would never walk and she ends up winning three gold medals in track i mean uh i i i got inspired all of these these heroes had obstacles that they had to overcome and they refused to quit and they they uh they became students of the game and um they're 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 superstars and being able to uh to try to emulate that in anything you do whatever whatever it is whether it be sport or business or or just being a really good dad, uh, you know it. It's it's um, it's it's all the same process. Uh, you you everything that you do in life has three phases to it. It has an amp, uh, an anticipation phase. What you think about before you do it. You have an action phase. What you think about during the task, and you have a reinforcement phase. How you respond to what just happened to you. And um, I think the, the anticipation phase is, I think everybody tries to prepare for whatever they're doing. I don't know. I, I don't think they necessarily know the optimal thing to think about or, or try to have it repeat, but they should. Uh, but I think the most important one is what you think about after you finish mm -hmm. the, whether it be a race or or, or, or a test in school or or a, a business deal uh, is that um, or do you respond to what happens or do you react to what happens? I mean, reacting takes no mental maturity at all. 
if you but to respond appropriately and realize that a lot of things that happen to us are teaching or lessons and if we treat them as a lesson we'll get better uh, making mistake is not a mental error making a mistake and learning from it is an, is a requirement to get better and i've never met a champion yet that didn't didn't admit that they made tons of mistakes but the difference between them and the guys that didn't win is that they learned from theirs and they didn't let them beat themselves up so I, you know i i just did the same thing I, you know okay let's find a vehicle that runs and then and then let's let's learn how to how to really get get really good at it um and so i lucked out though um my father was a was a solution based coach and um he began to teach me how to shoot he didn't know anything about target shooting really not a lot he knew about combat target shooting but he didn't know about olympic rifle shooting but he uh found out that there was a marksmanship unit at the unit that, that he was based at it's the, the base that he he was at and he went over the marksmanship unit and learned about target shooting came back and started teaching me and uh that ended up with him spending so much time over there that they asked him to run the program and he did and wow. one thing my dad was really good at was he was good at building people uh and um he was so effective at doing that that the United States Army marksmanship unit at Fort Benning uh they my dad was reassigned there as a coach and uh, so i go from from not seeing anybody uh like when 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 uh, the way my dad taught me how to shoot is he got the keys to render because the, the that that program that first program that i went to uh that they let me shoot that one one week when i went back the next week they canceled the program something wrong with the range and so so i i ended up my dad ended up uh, not not showing me the great example of you don't just quit when you have one obstacle. He said, I, I walked out of that range thinking that my shooting career was over. And I told my dad, I said, I think I'm this is the most disappointed I've ever been in my entire life. And and he said, what are you disappointed about? I said, I'm not going to get to shoot. He says, don't give up so easy, son. They're not going to get to shoot. But that doesn't mean you're not going to get to shoot. We'll find wow. a We'll find a way. And he got the keys to an indoor range nobody was using and began to teach me how to shoot. Fifteen months later, I'm national junior champion with a rifle in my country. Wow. Well, I would love to tell you that I had a special gift for, for shooting, but that wasn't the case. What what my path to get there was not it was was not common though. The the first half of it, I was on the range all by myself. Now most people don't learn how to how to to master something alone. Normally there there's a group, you know, you 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 you're training with a group. Well, there's a lot of drama in a group. Uh, there's a lot of negative imprinting in a group. I had none of that. Mm. I didn't have any positive imprinting either. I did, but but I learned a lot about self reliance. I learned I learned how to to that what I needed to do was get better today than I was yesterday. I, I learned those things. And my father was a solution-based coach. I would find out much, much later that when you talk about the solution, your self-image grows. When you talk about problems, self-image shrinks. So he told me things like, well, we're, there's only one best way to do anything. We're going to learn everything we can about that one best way. And when I didn't, I shot a bad shot. He didn't tell me, here's what you're doing wrong. He said, here's what we need to do. Here's what we need to do. And then, well, how does this compare to what the one best way? Well, we, here's what you need to do. I'm, I was always taught the solution, to search for the solution, not to repeat the problem. Well, you, I, I don't know. Maybe running is different. But if I go to a tournament and I ask, uh, I ask uh, competitors after they finish, how did they do? Do they tend to talk about what they did right or what they did wrong first? That's not rhetorical. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> it depends. I, I, I think it depends. There's some people that will cross the finish line 
defeated and and just think of all the negative things but i think the ones that are are successful are the ones that 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 recognize the mistakes that they made but then are thinking like you like your dad that that i need to fix that i had a problem with um nutrition i need to fix that how can i make that better i yeah. think that's that's the the ones that are successful and the ones that have fun and that are in the sport the longest are the solution finders. Yeah, I think you're right. And and this is this is what I had to learn. I had to, I, I had to learn that. But my but my dad was a good a good he gave me the 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 information in a way that I I could use it early on. I mean, that's normally that those kind of habits and responses occur after somebody's been at it for a long time. They need to be taught that when they first start learning form, and and they're not. And, and most sports, I I don't know of a sport that teaches form at, at 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 the mental game at the beginning, when you first learn form. They should. It would be more effective if they did. Uh, but, um, but most, most, uh, most people don't, most people learn how to learn how to do something the way I did. And it's, it's a, it's not the best way. Uh, but, uh, when my dad was so successful and he was assigned to the United States Army Marksmanship Unit, the international rifle section at, at where he went to work was where all of our Olympic champions were in the United States dominated the Olympics at that time in history. And all of them were stationed at the unit that my dad was at. Well, I took advantage of that. I go from not having anybody to see to having the best in the world, and I spent all of my uh, every every hour that I could over there asking them, "Well, how did you do that? Why did you do that? You know, how did you get to be who you are?" And um, so that's a real good question, real real good thing to do. Find the, find somebody who's really good and wear them out. <laughs> what did you find in speaking to these uh, future champions or current champions that it was a common theme or thread that you acknowledged? Wow, that's that separates that person from the rest. Did you did you explore that and find that out early on? Uh, well, when when uh, when I when I would talk to people, uh, I, I first of all first thing that I realized is is that there that it was common among all the sports that there was no real mental training in the early 70s. Yet, what made me uh, concerned about that is that every person I asked, every world champion I asked, and I've continued to ask this, next year will be my 50th year doing this. Uh, I I continue to ask people what percentage of what you do is mental, mm -hmm. and everybody told me the same thing. It's ninety percent of what I do is mental. My sport wow. is ninety percent mental. And I ask a second question: Well, if your sport's ninety percent mental, how much time and money have you spent on the mental game since you've been doing it? It's a very low number. It's probably inverse, maybe. Yeah. <laughs> and and, and uh, you say, well, that doesn't make sense. Does that make sense to you? That that no, you wouldn't do that in anything else in your life. You know, if ninety percent of your grade came from these test questions, you would learn those, <laughs> those test questions when you were in school. Uh, yeah, you know, if if I if you tell me where the money is, I in business, I, that's that's where I want to I want to go. I wouldn't pay, I wouldn't ignore it. And the thing that people think that is uh, 90% 90, 90 of the game, they often ignore that. Uh, and and that doesn't make sense. And and so when I didn't ignore it, um, I, I it, it was a game changer for me. And I think it's a game changer for a lot of my clients. Uh, and um, that's that's the reason I'm on this planet is to help people see that. And to uh, give them some stuff that works. So when I talk to these guys, um, I, I I saw a, a lot of things that, that were in common. Uh, one of the things that that really amazed me 
was that uh, they weren't trying to win. Oh, interesting. They were, they were, they were trying to execute, but they weren't trying to win when they were competing. They were, there, there's a time to think about winning, but it's not when you're in the, in, in the competition. Uh, you've got more than enough to think about an execution than, uh, uh, you know, think about outcome. And the problem with outcome is that uh, if you alter what you're doing based on, and I'm not talking about strategy. There's a, there are times when you, you when, when strategy dictates that you do certain things. I'm just talking about somebody uh, va varying their their meth methodology based on based on outcome. And what what you do is you tend to you tend to overtry, and. Uh, and I, they, I had more than one person told me, oh, well, I know what's wrong with you. You're <laughs> over trying. And uh, you're, um, well, I, I, gosh, I had heard that uh, to, to be successful, you've got to give it all you got. Give it 110%, man. And uh, so I was over trying all the time. And they told me, so what when you shoot your best, how hard are you trying? I said, well, I'll shoot my best in practice. I'm not really trying that hard in practice. I said, well, why don't you learn from that? <laughs> <laughs> so so finally, I one guy told me this, that, that I'll never forget it. I wish I had written down uh, who he was. And that's the one mistake I made with those two years of research. I should have documented every conversation I had because some of those guys that I talked to were were famous. I'm I'm certain that I talked to to, to some really famous people, and uh, uh, and I, I, that would have been, made a great book. You know, I thought about it at the time, but uh, I think I could get information that just a reporter or a, a an author couldn't get because they were willing to open up to me because I'd been to the show. You know, right. And uh, and I was I wasn't just nobody. Uh, I could understand what Olympic pressure was like. So uh, they. Hey, Lanny, I have a question. Sure. So so, silver medal in Munich, and you decide I need to go interview a whole bunch of people, and you learned a whole bunch of stuff from them, and then you turn around and uh, at the next Olympics in Montreal, you get a gold. Um. What did you change? What was the what was the biggest change? Um, are we talking about the 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 three spheres, and in, you know imprints? What 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 gave you the the edge that you needed? Well, to start with, uh, I I would I break it down into three three parts, uh, and I just teach these three parts. Is uh, the first one is. You've got to understand how performance is really generated. Most people are operating off of an incomplete model. That mm. a lot of people are operating off of, of it's 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 instead of conscious subconscious self image, it's just subconscious. It's skill. That's that's what the subconscious is. It's skill, and and uh, but what you think about matters, and so determining the the proper things to think about. Uh, before, during, and after a task is important, and um, and and self-image is important, and so uh, you need to work on all three of those. And uh, it's interesting that those three mental processes are directly related to the three phases of a task. The anticipation phase is a conscious circle issue. The action phase is a subconscious circle issue, and the reinforcement phase either builds or tears down your self-image based on how you handle that. Ah, and so uh, uh, you've got to you've got to to master all three of those in order to reach the top of your your potential. So what happens to people is that if they don't pay attention to the to the mental game, then they're going to be beaten by people that that do, and especially today, because 
we're we're a lot further down the, the road to using mental management than we were or mental training in in general than we were in the 70s when I, nobody believes that it, you can't learn it anymore uh the, the the bad thing about it today is that it's not it ha we haven't gotten to the point to where technical coaches include mental coaching uh, as a part of their training mm -hmm. if they did two things would happen they w their students would learn form faster and their students would do be more consistent in tournaments if they taught them a few things uh, about the mental game in the very beginning instead of ignoring it. And and I I think that most technical instructors, here's here's the thing. If if you if you're gonna tell somebody here's how you need to do something, but you don't tell you you don't tell them what they're supposed to think about when they do it. You leave it up to them. What's the probability that they're gonna I don't know, just fall into the right thing. Mm. Think about, I mean, if you, if you knew what the right thing to think about, I mean, I, I'll tell you one way to find out, just go talk to the top guys and say, well, what are you thinking about when you do that? I mean, that's a good place to start. <laughs> now they're not always going to think about exactly the same thing, but, but there's probably a pattern to that. And, and you can, you can figure it out now. Um, that's what we have done. We we've just we continue to make application to mental management and different kind of things. I started out uh, just teaching Olympic athletes, and that was a bad business model. First, <laughs> yeah, first of all, there's not very many of them out there. The market's pretty small, and secondly, they're all broke. I mean, this is not golfers. <laughs> this is this is Olympic athletes, and they don't have any money, and uh, uh, so I, I decided that uh, that's a poor business model. So about the first fifteen years, I just taught one hundred percent sales, sales training, leadership, business applications, because they would pay for 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 information. And then uh, the PJ Tour found found me and. Uh, not uh, that's been a big part. Golf's been a big part of what we we've done. It's a big sport, uh, and uh, and I I still like shooting, so I still teach a lot of shotgun and and uh, uh, precision rifle shooting. Not so much Olympic rifle anymore, but because it's a pretty small group. But uh, but shotguns a big shotgun shooters have money, and so uh, <laughs> you know it's it's okay to 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 do that. Now my daughter teaches. Uh, she teaches sports that have um, uh, have judges, like uh, gymnastics, figure skating, uh, pageantry is a big, big, hmm. big, big, a lot of pressure in pageantry for these girls, especially in the interview portion. And so she's built an entire business on just on working with with ladies, in, in various sports that they that that have pressure. Uh, my son Troy is uh, probably ninety percent of his clients are junior golf. Uh, his clients are their parents, but uh, the one he's teaching is the kids. And um, so I'll teach anybody. I mean, I've, I've got like this week. I've taught. Uh, I've taught rodeo people. <laughs> um, and um, I don't know, wow, you know, I don't know who's going to come. A trader. I taught a trader this week, mm. uh, and so uh, I know occasionally we get runners. Uh, it's interesting because you've got long action phases in runners, right? And so you have an anticipation. Uh, uh, let's say the task is the run. Well, then you've got an anticipation phase. How what you think about before the run starts. And then you've got what you think about after that, after you finish the run. Okay, but what what are you thinking about? If, if this is a marathon or a long run, or a, you know, some some of you guys' competitions are hundred miles. I mean, I don't know, but it's long. Is you can't you can't run a mental process 
constantly for hours. So, but there are mental processes within that action phase. There's a mental process for the start of the race, for establishing a pace. There's a mental process for hills. There's a mental process for for uh, uh, when when your body starts talking to you, saying, you, I, "I don't want you to do this anymore." <laughs> and then and then uh, there's a mental process for the last lap. I mean, so so once you understand what gear you're in, uh, you can you can uh, navigate the mental game, and then uh, just um, enjoy the ride. Let, let's <laughs> let's talk about that ride. Let's let's take it to the trail for just a second, and and we're going to say it's a long trail run, and anybody can fill in the number of the length that they want, but they do last a long time. And so, what does the anticipation look like? When do you start anticipating? What kind of process do you use for anticipation? And how does how do some of the pieces look during the action phase when you're actually running it? So kind of walk us through some of those and and maybe we'll even get to the reflection phase because because that really is part of that self image part I think. So let's talk about anticipation. When should I start anticipating and what should it look like? All right, I think the first thing is you you have to have a mindset that is that's working in your advantage before the race starts. Okay, so no there's there's two things are happening at the same time. You have you have a routine, which is what you're physically doing. That's everything that you're physically doing is your routine. You have a, a, a pre-run routine. You have a post-run mm -hmm. routine. You know, it has to, all everything to do with stretching and all this kind of stuff. And whatever, whatever it is that you do, that's your routine. But what you're thinking about while you do it, that's a part of your anticipation phase of the mental process. Well, I think that the, there are two things that you probably should be doing, everybody should be doing, is the first thing is that you should rehearse how you want to feel today. Ah. Okay, so how do I want to feel? How do I want to feel? And most of my clients determine adjectives that mean something to them, like, you know, consistent, confident, powerful, bulletproof, um, just, I, I used aggressively smooth. I like mm -hmm. that. It may, it may, it meant, meant something to me. Um, uh, and so you have a set of, of phrases, trigger words, if you will, that, that means something to you that gets you where you are totally committed that you can do this it's an it's a it's an it's an i got you i got this feeling of mm -hmm. of uh anticipation of intention of, of positive intention uh, in the beginning and the second thing is is, is you're going to remind yourself of the critical moments of the th of things that you need to physically do so if you if, if you have a mental process for that sport. Like when, when we when we teach golfers, we have a uh, um, we have a thing we call uh, preload, which which is consists of three steps. It's it's uh, strategy, uh, and then there's rehearsal, and then there's commitment, and then we have the mental program, which is right before you hit the shot. You've got a point of initiation, a point of alignment, point of focus, and then you hit the shot. And the action phase is so fast in, in, in golf or shooting that you don't have to worry about what you think about during the action phase. That's not the case in running mm. because your action phase has these mental processes in it. And so uh, that's, that's what you should think about. We call that preset. Uh, and, and, and we normally do that, like with golfers, we normally do the preset uh, before they even get to the driving range or putting green to warm up, is that they are thinking about how do I want to feel today. But mm. certainly before you get engaged with other with other uh, athletes, 
Uh, so, so you want to find some quiet place to rehearse these things, to get yourself really ready to go. And um, then, then, uh, um, I think, cool. Lanny, I, I think that's one of the golden nuggets I'm taking from today's show is even on a training run, I'm always thinking, okay, this is the purpose for the run. I need to do, you know, this many hours or this many, many minutes or miles or whatever. And I'm going to be working on this technique, but I never think or start the run with the anticipation phase of how do I want to feel today on my run? And I, I, I think I'm going to, I'm going to try to implement that in, in my everyday run. Um, so I, I, I think that's an interesting paradigm shift for me. Yeah. If you're, if you're a competitor, uh, you don't want to forget to do that in your in your training, because if you don't do it in your training, if it's not your habit to do in your training, you'll forget to do it in tournaments. Yeah. So then the reinforcement phase, which in my my view is self image is is built or torn torn down based on how you respond to what just happened to you. I, I don't personally think that that the race is all that important, that the place on the leaderboard is all that important. If what happens to you in life is not really very important. It's what you do next that's important. Mm -hmm. Because I think I I think in the in the previous uh um chat that we had back in twenty fourteen, I think you said if I can remember right don't think what happened to me, but what happened for me. Yeah, Is that two, right? Yeah. Did two, I get that right? To you versus well, for what you. What I was talking about there, and that's close, but what I was talking about <laughs> that a lot of things happen to you in life that at, yeah. the time, at the time you think it's happening to you, when later on you look back and said, boy, I'm, glad, I'm so glad that happened. It was not happening to me. It was happening for me. Right. I mean, if if I'd have been an even average baseball player, I never would have won a gold medal in Olympics in shooting. Right. I wouldn't have won yeah. a gold medal in Olympics in baseball either. <laughs> baseball didn't make it in the Olympics. It was in there for a while, and then they got, got out. Um, but uh, uh, shooting is a perfect sport for somebody who's not going to be a good baseball player. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Lanny, I'm going I'm to take us back um, to the action phase. And um, historically, as a long run with things that happen, we get some low spots. You're out there for a long time. You're going to be, you, you either put yourself in a low spot or it just comes upon you for whatever reason. Maybe your stomach goes or your legs are starting to feel heavy. Maybe your attitude starts to decrease a little bit because you need some nutrition. Um, what can we do as athletes? to help us through that low spot? What kind of action step can we take to help us remove ourselves from that low? Well, you don't have a good mental game unless that you have a strategy to overcome every distraction possible in a run. Okay. Okay. So you have to anticipate those possibilities. And if every perceived distraction must have an appropriate practiced planned appropriate practiced strategy to overcome that distraction mm. okay so so what's the the optimum thing for you to think about rather than to think about the distraction once you know the the issue what is the solution to that issue? And and once you know what it is and you have the strategy practice to where it automatically kicks in when this when this happens. Uh, I a lot of the the runners and the skiers, I used to work with biathletes quite a bit, and uh, uh they're shooting athletes. <laughs> <laughs> they're working hard. And uh uh so the, the, uh, some of them were using music as mm -hmm. as a, a, a the tempo of music 
to to be able when when this happens i switch to this song or this speed or this tempo mm. and and that gets me gets me off of this issue uh and um you know you can't a conscious mind can only think of one thing at a time and it can't think about pain and something else at the same time so so if you're if you're engaged i mean this this is why people talk about in war they'll 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 be in be in combat and all of a sudden the combat's over and they realize they've been shot they didn't they just they were thinking about something else they didn't think about the fact that they've been shot uh and so it's it it's it's the it's the same thing you you know you got to think about that long before it happens you got and that's the reason why you need to have i i and and um, a high priority on the mental game uh, when you need to say, okay, what's the best thing for me to think about at the start of the race? I mean, to establish that, you know, what's my strategy? Do I want to, do I want to go out front or do I want to, you know, what, what do I want to do? What's the strategy? What, what tools do I need? Uh, mental tools do I need to be able to execute that? Uh, then establishing a pace. Well, that that may vary depending on what, where you are in the race. Maybe the the pace that you start it with is not the pace that you have, you know, miles down the road. Whatever, whatever you you have a strategy, and and you got that planned out. That that when I do this, I I, I get the best times, and uh, so. You, all of this is known in advance, and when you have a distraction like uh, like what you're talking about, you have a a, a pre plan, practice, strategy to overcome that. Oh, I, I I like that, and it's almost part of the anticipation uh, piece of 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 rehearsing. If this happens, then I do this, because one thing that happens to us out there is we lose several IQ points as we're running. We can't do simple math anymore. It just, it's not there. And if you're trying to figure out your problem and sort it out with a brain that isn't working, there's a fat chance that you're not going to come up with the right answer. So going and simply making some rules, when this happens, I do this, when this happens, I do this, and then just playing that tape and letting it happen and then anticipating it coming, seeing it and recognizing it early, and then putting that play and process because you've been there. You've done that. When this happens, I'm listening for it. It's happening. Now I do this, you solve it, you move on. And so that's what it sounds to me like uh, anticipation leads into action. Yeah. And it's even better than that. Um, well, I thought that was pretty good, Lanny. <laughs> it's, even, it's even better than that in the sense that if you have a a plan practice strategy for something like this because you have a strategy the distra the, the 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 distraction shows up less often mm. Mm. just having a strategy right. it's, it's the people that don't have a strategy and now they're expecting it to happen oh then it'll happen every time if you're expecting it to happen but uh -huh. if you have a strategy and you know if this happens i do this and by having a strategy you will you will have the the distraction fade and sometimes you you just you're finished and you think gosh i, I didn't have trouble with that <laughs> and the and, early Earlier you, earlier you can catch it, the better off you are, because it is, it is something that can slip away and get out of control unless you're, you're observant and you can witness it coming. And the sooner you see it, the, the sooner it goes away. That's right. That's hey, let's, let's get into that final phase, which I think uh, you mentioned is probably the most important. And, and I think you may have alluded to that the, the, the last phase, the reflection phase is maybe where the 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 rubber meets the road or where the elite pull away from the rest of the crowd and that is reflecting on what happened during the action phase and finding solutions to improve in the future talk to us a little bit more about I think, that i think that that uh, most sports can have 
find value in having what we call reloading reloading the event you know it's 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 a it's a three step process the first step is to is to evaluate what just happened now the champ champions tend to reinforce what they did right uh we, mm. we teach people to keep a performance journal and and uh to determine after every practice session and after every competition they write down uh in their journal they find, they choose three things that they did exceptionally well today and every time that you think about talk about write about something you you tend to become it more often it builds your self image in that direction so let's find three things that you did really really well today whether if, regardless of what it was so let's let's do a at least a two sentence paragraph about each one of those in the journal and then let's talk about what you learned what you learned is the things that didn't go well and what are you going to do about it so so the then one section you write down well this here's what i learned and here's what i'm going to do or here maybe i need to train this this or i need to discover this or i need to remember this whatever it is you write that down in a in a journal so you're reinforcing what happened what that you liked and then you're reinforcing what you need to do and every time you talk about a solution self-image grows every time you're talking about what you did right self-image grows so you're in control of self-image growth regardless of what the score was regardless of what the time was it, you your it your self-image can't shrink if you do it that way now, if you just don't have a plan for the reinforcement phase, then you're they're likely to react instead of respond. And you you knew how to react when you entered this world. Uh, when things went well as a as a as a baby, you you were happy and cooing, and you were really nice. And when things didn't go well, uh, you screamed your little head off. And uh, so you already knew how to do that. But but to to respond takes some mental maturity. It takes some discipline, and uh, that's what the top people know. And they know that they can't. They have to control this happen, the, the, their emotions when when they're uh, when they're performing. And there there's a time to think about winning, and and that's not when you're complete c competing. Uh, but the time to think about winning is when you're goal setting. When you're training um, and things like that, and then uh, you 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 want to evaluate properly. So so evaluation uh, and then reinforcement and then and then let it go. Let 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 the let the problems go. In other words, don't don't talk about it to other people. Don't talk about what went wrong to other people. Don't complain about it to other people uh you you will you will have more trouble with those problems if you complain about them and your self-image gets scarred and uh it's a little bit like like eating a dish on a on a plate and you left some food there and you didn't really want to eat that and it didn't taste good and but you the next meal you just kind of use that same dish you wouldn't want to do that use that do you want a clean dish well clean it up get rid of it i'm not thinking mm -hmm. about that anymore i'm not talking about it anymore i'm done with it and uh, remember what you did right if you do a good job on that the other thing that you can do which is which i've got all of my students doing now is you could do a voice memo where you can take your all smartphones have a voice recorder on it you can hit the recorder and say, oh, this is Lanny Basham. I'm at the ABC tournament. What I did well was mm. about a minute there. And what I did, what I, what I learned was, and then what I'm going to do about it is. And then uh, you've got that recording and put your email in there and it, it sends it recording to your email. And if you put your coach's email, you put your middle coach's email in, whatever it is. And they uh, all of the students that I'm coaching uh, when they're competing, uh, 
I, I get their voice memos, and so I can listen to them, and I can see where they are, where, where they're at. Well, Lanny, you're right. We, we, things have changed, and we do all have uh, cell phones in our pockets, smartphones that do all kinds of things. And if we're ever wondering what we think about ourselves or others think about themselves, we can pull out our phones and look on social media apps, and we can see all kinds of people advertising success or speaking about defeat, or we try to measure ourselves against whoever can come up with some, some amazing story. What are your thoughts on social media and how that impacts our self-image? Well, if you've got a social media app that, that eliminates all of the talk about their problems, you can listen to social media. <laughs> okay. Well, well stated. <laughs> well stated. It looks like I need to do some deleting, Lanny. <laughs> hey, speaking of that, I think one of the things in the in your book that you talk about um, is who you surround yourself with. I think is important for your self image, right? Um, you know, you can surround yourself with with. Talk to us about that. Well. Uh... There, there's there, your self image grows or shrinks based on imprinting, and uh, there's the different kinds of imprints. What you actually do is an imprint. If you're successful, it imprints. It's likely to do that. If you're fail, if you're not successful, that, that imprints too. Uh, but what you, who you're around is an imprint. What you think about, talk about, write about, those are all imprints. But what you uh, who you're around. Uh, you tend to you tend to feed off of what we're herd animals, so we tend to want to flock, and uh, um, so you you if you're around really good 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 performers, you tend to you tend to want to be that uh, be like them, and uh, that's why parents are so concerned with their who their kids all around with, because if all of your if all of your child's friends are drug dealers. That's not good. <laughs> so if, if if you're around good performers, uh, you tend to you tend to perform a little bit better. You tend to become who you're around. So so uh, you don't want to stay too too long around guys that are complaining and and uh, and, and and you want you want to be around the guys that uh, that are better than you are. If you can do that, now the better you get, the harder it is to find guys that are better than you are. And uh, so you might have to go out of the country. <laughs> hey, Lanny, can you be my friend? <laughs> I want you as my friend. Well, yeah. well, you can, you can, you can join us. I'm, I'm going to develop a community of people that want to talk about winning and talk about the middle game. And uh, so just keep in touch with me and uh, pop me your email out at, and I will, I will let put you on the list here. Uh, we got some ex exciting things coming up, uh, and uh, I, I think that uh, if you enjoyed this kind of stuff, then uh, um, I, 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 want, I want you part of that. It won't be expensive, so yeah. <laughs> we, we've got the uh, the website to to talk about coming up before we close. But I want to ask this question because um, number one, we listened to our 2014 episode, and and it was so much great stuff. I thought. To myself, we're going to talk to yeah. Lanny, and I hope we don't just go over everything that we said because everything was so wonderful. I'm fearful that we're just going to do a repeat. We there's so much out there we didn't touch on. Please go back, listen to that past episode, and you'll learn so much, and you'll recognize this question. I'm going to bring it up just in case some people can't go back in time to 2014, which I think was one of the major takeaways and the reason that when people ask me. What's your favorite episode with TRN? You've got guys have done 600 plus episodes. Which one is your favorite? And it's always the same answer for me. It's Lanny Basham. That was the very, very best episode that I was part of. And the question that comes to mind when I think about that episode is what is the first thing you should ask your kid or your student or your athlete after a competition? What's the most important thing to ask? And this stayed well, with me. What you don't want to ask them is how they do, because that's an open-ended question, and the world is negatively charged 
they're most likely going to talk about what they did wrong if you ask it that way. That's not a good question. Mm. So a better question would be to ask them what did they what did they do right. You know, uh, narrow it down. Get them talking about what they did well. And uh, people, you know, the the world wants you to talk about what you did wrong. And uh, that's what the news is all about. You know, when. To, but people need to be need to reinforce their self image. They need to build self image, and parents can and coaches need to learn that. So, what did you do right? Let's talk about what worked, and uh, let's reinforce that so that it works more often in the future. And the second question would be, what did you learn? Now, it's okay to talk about what you learned. I mean, how, where do you where do you learn? You don't learn when things go right. You learn well. Maybe, maybe you don't learn a little bit that you, you that you wanted to continue to turn, to do that, but but you don't learn anything new when things go right. You learn when they don't. That's that's when you learn the most. When so so making mistakes not a mental error. Uh, what what's it teaching you? Once you you know, let's talk about what did I learn out there. I will I learn any to work more on this. I need to know more about that. Uh and so it's what did you learn is a critical uh question that is the next question. And finally, what are you gonna do about it? Hmm. You know, is it is this gonna build you or break you? What are you don't ask that, but that's that's that that you know failure is a choice. Mm, yeah. Uh, we 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 don't we we as long as you you don't actually have to be perfect. I don't think anybody. I don't that that's only happened once, and you ain't it. <laughs> so it it's you 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 don't want to seek perfection. You want to seek progress. You want you want to, nice. you want to be better today than you were yesterday, and uh, uh, you'll always be growing, and that's great. Here's what I've noticed, Lanny. You have a lot of things in threes. You have three spheres. You have three pieces with your action, uh, anticipation, action, and uh, reflection. There's three. And then you have three questions that you ask. So there's a lot of threes in your world, a lot of rules that come about in, 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 uh, in, in threes. You know, there's a reason for that. Rifle shooters can't remember four. <laughs> <laughs> well, there you go. <laughs> Hey, if if you if this conversation is was enjoyable to you, and you're thinking, you know what, I need to get me a little bit of that. I need to be a little bit better at at with my conscious thinking, my subconscious thinking, and my self image, and get more positive imprints in my life. Um, you can find more at. Uh, uh, but first of all, go get Lanny's book right. with winning in mind. You got to get that book. It's the third edition, I think, is the current one. It's got to be a staple on your bookshelf if you want to be uh, have fun out there on the trail. And then um, the the website will link in the show notes. The new website is with winning in mind dot my kajabi. That's m y k a j a b i dot com. I know that. Uh, I don't know where you came up with that that word, Lanny, but it's a little bit tough. That's we're, the software. We're gonna. Oh, okay, that's a software. Anyway, we're gonna link that in the show notes. So all you need to do is click on that. But you can you can hire Lanny as as a coach. He has um, a lot of other coaches there. You can learn more about his philosophy. It's just a uh, uh, more to learn out there. We should be spending ninety percent of our time thinking about mental management. So, Lanny. Thank you so much for agreeing to come back on the episode. We're glad that you forgot how miserable the last one was with us. Uh, it took us, it, it only took us, what, nine years, almost 10 years to get you back on. So thank you for agreeing to come back on. It's not a problem. Thank you very much. You guys have a good week. Well done, Lanny. So, so good. Yeah, yeah. you are. You, <laughs> You're a, a, a wonderful, wonderful, bright light in, in the world. You've done a, a wonderful job. Thank you so much. Yeah. And and we love that there's transference of, of this methodology to all aspects in someone's life, you know, whether it's rifle shooting or a sport or being a, the best parent you can be or 
successful in business, the best husband or wife. Um, I think it all translates. It's, it's success. 